in Canada over the last hundred years, we have tried five separate models of the Canadian wheat board. So in 1917, there was a, a government mandated wheat board called the Board of Grain Supervisors. In 1919, there was another government mandated Canadian wheat board. Then in the 1920s, there was a central selling agency, which was a voluntary farmer mandated wheat board. In 1935, again, the government brought in a mandated voluntary wheat board. And then in 1943, we ended up with essentially the model that we have now, a government mandated mandatory wheat board. And my point here is that we have tried already all of these different attempts, all of these different models. We've had two voluntary boards that we've tried in the 20s and the 30s. And what we've ended up with were financial catastrophes, which left farmers and governments at the time in the lurch. And moving ahead a little bit in, in the time frame then, in 1998, the Liberal government changed the legislation and handed over responsibility for the wheat board, for the government, the uh, governance and the operations, to the farmers through this elected board of directors. And farmers really accepted this responsibility and have been actively engaged in improving the cane wheat board and making significant changes since 1998. So for example, uh, while farmers can still commit their grain to the wheat board for sale by the wheat board, those same farmers can now take early payment options. They can take fixed price options where they're pricing their grain on a daily basis and prices that are linked to commodity exchanges around the world. Uh, these same farmers can lock in basis through basis contracts or with malt barley they can use a cash plus system. And what my, my point here is that this Canadian wheat board is not the old and inflexible Canadian wheat board that our opponents are saying it is. A lot of our opponents are caught in a trap where they're fighting against a wheat board that no longer exists. They're fighting against a wheat board from the 1940s or the 1950s or the 1960s. Since May 2nd of, the, of this year though, the federal government has placed farmers in a really difficult position. Essentially saying that while you farmers are paying all the costs, you should have no say in your uh, marketing future. So it's farmers pay, but farmers have no say. That, in my mind, in a lot of other people's minds, is really unacceptable. So the first question that I've got is, where is the government's plan? This particular government has been in office for, of course, not exactly the same government, but a lot of the same people have been there since 2006. They've been putting forward much the same position, although they, uh, with variations. But it has always been clear that a lot of their key MPs and their leader have always wanted to dismantle the Canadian wheat board. So isn't it reasonable that after six years of them being in government, that they would have a plan that they could publish, a plan that they could distribute to farmers, some sort of discussion paper that we could all be talking about it seems just, you know, why haven't they published such a paper? Is it really as simple as the government not having a plan? And in court documents that were filed in 2007 uh, as part of a, uh, the, the case around barley, when the government illegally tried to remove barley from the jurisdiction of the wheat board, government officials stated under oath that they had done absolutely no financial analysis of the impact of the removal of BART from the Canadian Wheat Board. So my question is, is that a responsible government? It, it, is that, are those the actions or inactions of responsible politicians who are looking at the destruction of a, of a $6 billion uh, corporation that gets that $6 billion after costs all back to the farmers? So what's the value of the Canadian Wheat Board? Ward has just spent a lot of time uh, talking about that, and we've heard about the, the half billion dollars uh, that are quoted quite regularly. But what about some of the other benefits? And I want to talk about freight rates for a minute. Minister Ritz is on the public record since May the 2nd, 
saying that he doesn't agree or believe in the revenue cap. This revenue cap has the effect of us paying lower rates at the moment than the so-called commercial rate. It turns out that the commercial rates that people talk about, for a 100 car spot, those commercial rates are 90% higher than the rates under the revenue cap. So what's that mean, 90% higher? Well, Swift Current, the freight rates are roughly $40 a ton. If you talk in terms of 90% higher than that, you're talking somewhere over $70 a ton to move that same grain. And the fact is the railways would charge more or less depending on what they thought the market would bear. But if you use the back of the envelope math and think in terms of 20 million tons being shipped at these commercial rates, right away you're talking about an extra $600 million a year in cost savings right now because of the revenue cap. And I've been around farm organizations. Uh, I've been around um, a lot of people that did a lot of negotiating in the Kruger SBA transportation uh, discussions uh, at the turn of the century, basically, late 1900s and, and early 2000s. And it's absolutely clear that without the Wheat Board's involvement, without a strong uh, policy effort by the Canadian Wheat Board, we wouldn't have a revenue cap. I mean, there were, there were other farm organizations, don't get me wrong, pushing for a revenue cap, but these organizations are always under-resourced in terms of people and money. And to go up against the railways and the, the grain company funded AstroTurf organizations, which are their friends, you need some resources and you need some expertise and you need people like Ward and you need other people from the policy department in the Canadian Wheat Board, you, know, you need people who absolutely understand the grain trade. There's very few of us in here that can say we do that. I can't say that I understand the grain trade, and I've been working in this one way or another since 1990. But these organizations need help, and the Canadian Wheat Board, because of its strong position, can deliver that assistance. Just sticking with freight rates for a minute, as the key supporter of research into existing rail charges, the Canadian Wheat Board identified that farmers right now are being overcharged by $200 million a year in the, in the freight that they're moving, even under the, the existing legislation that we have. The general farm organizations like the Farmers Union and the CFA affiliates have tried to advance this file and recover this money for farmers, but the government and their friendly organizations have steadfastly resisted that effort. And uh, they've essentially erected a, a brick wall. So nothing is happening at the moment on trying to recover that $200 million per year. But what I'm trying to get across is, without the Canadian Wheat Board helping to do that initial research and, and work with these general farm organizations, we wouldn't even know today that we're being overcharged $200 million a year. The only people that would know that are the railways themselves. And what about other ag policy issues? It's almost 10 years ago now that uh, farmers fought hard to keep genetically modified wheat out of the field, at least until the marketing and consumer acceptance concerns had been dealt with. And Rennie Van Acker, who was uh, at the time uh, working in Manitoba and is now an assistant dean at the University of Guelph, uh, pegged the increased chemical cost of having Roundup Ready wheat in the fields at being at least $400 million per year. And the decreased marketing ability was also pegged at hundreds of millions of dollars less per year. And the Canadian Wheat Board played a key role by talking to Canada's customers and avoiding a, a, a real marketing meltdown at the time. Now we don't have enough time uh, to cover the list, which is extensive of all this policy money. Uh, but I think, again, my point uh, has been made with these few examples. It's easy to identify these hard dollar benefits, like the price premiums, 
and the effects in, in transportation and not uh, filling capacity but not overfilling the capacity. But there are these other and many other and in fact larger policy dollar benefits that we all benefit from by having the Canadian Wheat Board and we don't routinely think about those policy benefits. And those benefits will be lost uh, if the Wheat Board, if the, if the government is successful in dismantling the Wheat Board, with, if they start, as Ward said, some other sort of company which would be operating in the open market, those policy benefits will still be lost. I was extremely clear when I ran uh, for the position of Director of the Canadian Wheat Board just six months ago. I ran on a very strong single desk ticket in southwestern Saskatchewan and all of southern Alberta. At that time, and since that time, I said that I would go wherever the numbers took me. If the, if the business case for the Wheat Board could, could prove to me that the Wheat Board was a good deal for farmers and was returning more money to the farmers, I would support that business case. If the numbers showed me that the Wheat Board was doing a poor job, I would, I would go wherever those numbers took me. But after being there for just six months, I've been able to look at over at least some of these numbers, and I'm more convinced than ever that the Wheat Board is doing a tremendous job for farmers. There is no other model and no organization, no other organization that's going to return even a fraction of this benefit to the farmers. The second point uh, is now more about this plebiscite. Uh, we're engaged in this plebiscite because the federal government is refusing to follow the laws of Canada. The laws of Canada say if they're going to remove a grain in whole or, or in part, they have to have a farmer vote. But again, the government has been clear on the public record saying that they don't intend to do that. In fact, they say they will go as far as repealing the Canadian Wheat Board Act as it exists, which would be a wind-up of the organization, a cancelling of the governance structure, the directors, everything that's there, just in order to avoid having to trigger that farmer plebiscite. And that's one of the pieces that's already in court. There's already a legal action in play over that that has been brought by an organization called the Friends of the Canadian Wheat Board. But by refusing to allow that, by refusing to follow the laws of Canada and trigger that vote, the government has deliberately created uh, a situation where we have conflicting mandates. So the government MP argue that, well, we were elected on May the 2nd. So we represent the farmers. I argue I was elected um, in December, basically, six months ago, uh, on this very narrow issue, and this issue of the strong mandate of the Canadian Wheat Board, and I argue that I represent the farmer. Well, in my district, uh, my MP happens to be David Anderson. Well, and so we've got this conflicting mandate, right? Uh, in, in Alan Olberg's district, uh, one of his MPs is Jerry Ritz. Oh. And so these farmers, a lot of them are voting one way during the federal election, but when they turn around and look at a very narrow issue and consider the facts around the Canadian Wheat Board, they're voting to support the Wheat Board. And it's like that in all of the other uh, districts where the, where the Canadian Wheat Board directors just stood for election again uh, six months ago. So the, the plebiscite is clear, and the questions are clear, and it's designed to help break this deadlock over this conflicting mandates and help answer this question, who is actually speaking on behalf of farmers on Canadian Wheat Board issues? And I'm going to close by saying that I will personally, I'll take my marching orders from this plebiscite. I think it's that important. If the, and whatever those results may be, and I expect others to do the same. So at the end of the day, if the farmers use the plebiscite and say they don't want the single desk, then that's going to become, uh, I'll respect that message. 
coming from the farmer. On the other hand, at the end of the day, if the farmers use this plebiscite to say that they do want to maintain the single desk marketing advantages of the Canadian wheat board, then I'm prepared to stand and fight, and fight hard for what's ours. And I want to... Make sure that you're with me. So, are you with me? Oh, yeah.